Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Minnesota House of Representatives Transportation Finance and Policy Committee for this uh, March 3rd, 2022. And our first item of business is to take the roll. Mr. Dodge. Chair Hornstein. Present. Hornstein, present. Vice Chair Cagle. Present. Cagle, present. Representative Petersburg. Petersburg, present. Petersburg, present. Representative Barr. Here. Barr, present. Representative Bernardi. Representative Bernardi. Representative Elkins. Elkins, present. Elkins present. Representative Frederick. Present. Frederick present. Representative Houseman. Present. Houseman present. Representative Heinrich. Heinrich present. Heinrich present. Representative Kosnick. Present. Kosnick present. Representative Mason. Mason present. Mason present. Representative Murphy. Murphy present. Murphy present. Representative Nelson. Nelson present. Nelson present. Representative Olson. Olson present. Olson present. Representative Richardson is excused. Representative Torkelson. Torkelson present. Torkelson present. Representative West. West present. West present. And Representative Bernardi. Bernardi present. Bernardi present. There is a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Uh, next on the agenda, we have approval of the minutes from our March 1st meeting. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It was very short minutes. Uh, it was only one presentation, so I moved the approval as presented. Minutes are moved. Is there discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails. Uh, members, we have a couple of bills on the agenda and an informational presentation. Uh, I think we'll, uh, hope, I hope to get to uh, the uh, informational presentation on quarters of commerce uh, approximately 2 p.m. Uh, so I hope we can get through these bills uh, in a half hour or so each. Um, our first bill, uh, it comes from Representative Joachim. It's House File 3296. And I will move that House File 3296 be um, uh, Re referred to the Committee on Commerce. And we have a couple, we have an amendment uh, that we would like to have adopted first. But Representative Joachim, um, I personally want to thank you for your work on this issue of salvage titles. Um, it has been a really vexing issue for this committee and, and the legislature in general. Uh, we decided to form a task force uh, in our omnibus bill last year that was passed into law. And you have done a great job. I know Representative Petersburg's been involved as well. Uh, and you forged some consensus on an issue. I never thought we would be able to do that. So thank you, thank you, thank you for the heavy lifting you've done. And I think we do have a, a bill that we can all be proud of. And we want to make a few small adjustments here in committee uh, before we send this on to commerce. So. Uh, I think our first item of business will be to take a look at the A1 amendment. This is an amendment that will get the bill in the shape that the author would like. I would like to move the A1. And if you want to explain that amendment, uh, uh, and we'll also call on Mr. Burris for any additional clarifications, uh, we'll be ready to roll with the bill. Uh, Representative Joachim, welcome. And again, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, members, for hearing House File 3296. Um, as you noted, this bill is a practice of a lot of work done by many stakeholders and the legislators on the working group over the course of the last several sessions. So the A1 amendment makes technical changes that the stakeholders agreed to that uphold the transparency for the consumer in the bill and clean up some underlying salvage title process language. So if Mr. Burris wants to delve a little bit deeper into those changes, um, I would turn it over to him. Uh, Mr. Burris. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, so the A1 amendment has, um, as Representative Joachim noted, some, some technical changes. There are a series of, of clarifying uh, items. Uh, one is on um, the, the definition of one of the, the terms that is um, uh, being established in the bill. Uh, there is some clarification on when a salvage title is 
is not required or a prior established tile is not required for uh, some vehicles that are that are stolen and then recovered again. Um, it also allows for stamping of a certificate of title with prior salvage. This is parallel to a, a stamping process that's uh, allowed under current law for uh, salvage um, titles or, or titles with uh, that would gain a, a salvage stamp that's instead of going through the, the application process with the department. Um, there are some conforming changes that relate to that that stamp to, to clarify brands or stamps to, that kind of work in effect uh, the same way um, under the under the statutes. Uh, there's a clarification about oral disclosure so that a verbal disclosure isn't required in situations of online sales of vehicles. Uh, and there's, there are a couple of um, phrasing changes to clarify about disclosure uh, involving flooding as well as um, only requiring disclosure on the part of dealers if there's actual knowledge of a, of a brand. Um, and that, uh, Mr. Chair, is the, the A1 amendment in a nutshell. Thanks so much, Mr. Burris. Thanks for that excellent uh, summation. Um, is there any discussion, members of the A1 amendment? Uh, I do not see any. Uh, so uh, with that, we'll just take a vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. 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 All opposed, the motion prevails. And we do now have um, uh, House File 3296 as amended before us. Now, members, there is one other um, sort of technical small amendment that I think is, is needed here. Um, there is a fiscal note uh, for House File 3296, uh, which you have included in your packets. And um, with the adoption of the A1, um, I just wanna make sure that there's no additional cost for DVS. I understand that there isn't, but uh, we'd like to have someone from DVS confirm that the A1 amendment does not have any added cost. So I know we have Mr. Zhang and, um, you know, Mr. Zhang, if you could, um, uh, come before us and, and indicate uh, your perspective on this amendment. I don't have a fiscal note. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record. Wonderful to see you again. Yes, thank you very much. Pong Zhang, Director of Driver and Vehicle Services. Um, and yes, the, to answer the question about the, oh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. To answer that question, there, there will be no uh, additional fiscal costs um, to the to the amendment or from the amendment and and again in totality no fiscal impact uh, to implement this proposal, and if I could I'll just take this moment to thank uh, the task force and uh, Representative Joachim, Rep Representative Petersburg, and all the members of the task force uh, for all their great work on this. Where we are um, very confident that this will close a lot of the challenges and loopholes that uh, will allow us to have um, uh, to brand titles appropriately. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Zhang, and thank you for your involvement with the task force as well. Uh, okay, members, well, um, you know, with that information, um, I think we can move uh, uh, what I would consider to be a non-controversial oral amendment here. Um, and that would be to delete the section that includes an appropriation. Um, I believe that is section 13 of the bill on page 10. So, Mr. Burris, can you confirm uh, that uh, oral amendment would be in order to delete the appropriation, or not in order, but maybe you just explain um, exactly what we're doing here? Uh, Mr. Then Chair, I'll call Representative Petersburg. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, so for an oral amendment, I have page 10, delete section 13, and that would uh, remove the appropriation section and it, it, it's standalone, so there aren't any other uh, tendrils in the bill that would be impacted by that. Excellent. Okay. Um, I did see Representative Petersburg's hand up at one time. Uh, Representative Petersburg, did you still want to comment? And your hand is down now. So, Actually, I was going to comment on, on the final bill, but I, oh. I agree with your oral amendment. I think that's a, uh, it's a good one. It's not necessary. It could have stayed in with zero and just taken out later, but it's fine to remove it now. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you for that, Representative Petersburg. Um, is there any further discussion to the oral amendment? Uh, seeing none, uh, then all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, the motion prevails. So we have um, 
our bill as amended before us, House File 3296. And we are in the shape that the author would like us to um, consider the bill. So with that, Representative Joachim, um, if you wanted to uh, make any additional comments, uh, those would be very much appreciated. And we have a few testifiers. And then we'll proceed to a discussion after that. Uh, Representative Joachim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you noted in last year's transportation omnibus bill, a salvage title task force was created. Both myself and Representative Petersburg served in the House, and Senator Jasinski and Senator Carlson were appointed in the Senate. Um, Senator Jasinski chaired um, the committee, and we got a lot of work done. Um, we met as a working group seven times during the interim. We received helpful input from stakeholders, directions from the Department of Public Safety, and the bill before you is the product of those meetings and conversations. Um, you also have a final report from the working group in your packets. It's scintillating reading, if you would like. And I also want to say a special thank you to Mr. Lucina for all the work that he put in to this task force and all the help and guidance he gave us. Um, in short, the core policy changes in the bill are to address title washing loopholes by requiring a salvage or prior salvage brand on all vehicles that are acquired by an insurance company as a total loss or that encourage damage over 80% of the vehicle value threshold, require written notice, uh, written disclosure of vehicle brands, flooding or other prior damage, extend the title branding and disclosure requirements to commercial vehicles as well as motorcycles. The changes eliminate scenarios where a vehicle that is neither high value nor late model can end up with a clear title, as well as treat in-state and out-of-state vehicles in a consistent manner. The changes also require disclosures that will aid consumers as they navigate purchasing damaged yet roadworthy vehicles. And more importantly, it ensures the agreement reached by the insurance industry and auto repair shops over the years related to high value and late model cars remain a viable definition of a salvage vehicle, while at the same time, allowing for more clarity for cars that fall outside that agreement's measure. A wide range of changes throughout the bill involve readability, clarity, and the flow of statutes on title branding. Some of those are in that A1, the amendment we just passed. They're based on suggestions and several discussions with the Department of Vehicle Services. This includes revising definitions, eliminating distinctions that are no longer necessary, and more clearly separating the brand requirements that happen in like two different sections of law, 168A.151 and 325F.6642. Um, brand provisions are further centralized as well. Um, with that, Mr. Chair and members, I think everyone involved in the working group appreciated the complex nature of this area of law. The working group chaired by Senator Jasinski did a great deal of work, and I think the progress made to get this language will aid consumers and strengthen our statutes, making the system work better for all of us. So I would welcome any comments from my colleague, Representative Petersburg, um, and then move it over to testifiers. We have Ron Elwood from Legal Aid and Pang Zhang, Director of Department and Vehicle Services. I also have a few of the stakeholders and other experts online who can answer more technical questions as well. Thank you, uh, Chair Joachim. And uh, also, I want to welcome you back to the committee that you've served on for so many years. It's wonderful to have you back. Um, Representative Petersburg, did you want to make any comments? Oh, yeah, I certainly can. I'll, I'll make my comments now, and I'll leave uh, anything till later. But uh, yes, I think this was a, a situation where we actually were looking for a way to help with consumers, especially those that were buying uh, lower priced vehicles. Uh, make sure that they had full disclosure on the damage to their vehicles uh, so that they were aware of what's going on and they can make the decision themselves. We wanted to get away from my ideas or places in which um, there was damage to a vehicle and unsuspecting buyers buy it, and then it became uh, unusable later. It, the bill also, as we started working on it, uh, found many issues from out-of-state vehicles that are coming in that were still of an issue. And I think this bill corrects all of those as well. So just as uh, uh, Representative Joachim said, we had a lot of people working on this. And finally, it, it came down to a, a, an agreement that fell in place. And I also want to thank everybody for the hard work. And so I'd certainly open it up for questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, members, let's um, thank you, Representative Petersburg. Thank you for your service on this uh, task force. We um, you know, were really able to you know, it was, it's a tough issue and, uh, you know, the ability, your, your leadership and, and Chair Joachim's leadership was so critical and, of course, our Senate partners as well. 
uh, to getting to consensus. This has been vexing for a number of years. And so it's really a great day. I feel really, really great about the work that you've accomplished. Um, so members, um, what we'll do is um, I have, again, as um, Representative Joachim said, we have Ron Elwood and Pong Zhang uh, lined up to testify. We'll take their testimony and then we'll move into discussion of the bill. Mr. Elwood, welcome back to the Transportation Committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, my name is Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. And uh, first, I also want to thank Representative Joachim and Representative Petersburg. As, as Chair Hornstein noted, this salvage title issue has been around for many, many years. And while there was general agreement on the broad goals, a global solution was elusive. Uh, but due to uh, Chair Joachim and, and Representative Petersburg's unflagging efforts to tackle this issue and bring the stakeholders together, they were able to fashion a solution everyone could coalesce around. And their efforts and the contributions of all stakeholders has borne fruit in the form of House File 3296 and the amendments that you adopted, which I urge you to pass, and I'm sure you all will. Um, I really also want to recognize the tremendous assistance and expert information provided by the DVS staff all through the process. They are to be commended and thanked. You know, when you can get the auto auctions, the repair shops, the auto dealers, the parts dealers, the insurance federation, and legal aid all to get behind the bill, that's saying something, quite an accomplishment. Uh, but seriously, this bill represents an important and long incoming advancement in transparency and consumer protection. At its core, as Representative Petersburg noted, this bill and its progenitors were aimed at giving consumers the information they need and deserve about a car they are contemplating purchasing in order to allow them to make an informed decision. This bill will not only help legal aid's clients when they are shopping for a car, but will also help all consumers when they are in market for a new or used vehicle. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 3296. Um, thank you, Mr. Elwood, and I want to personally thank you as well. Uh, you've been at this for a while, and I know that uh, you know your heart is where many of us are in, in protecting consumers. I mean, I think that's a, a bottom line, and really appreciate again your ability to work with everybody and, and, and get consensus. So thank you so much. And uh, now we're back to Mr. Zhang. Uh, welcome back, and uh, please proceed with your testimony, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Pong Zhang, Director of Driver and Vehicle Services. And again, I just want to thank the, the task force and, and convey my genuine appreciation for um, the opportunity to, to support the task force. Um, um, I've heard just numerous comments on, on the support that specifically Mr. Lucina was able to provide and we're, we're very happy to be able to offer that support. And I'm also very thankful to Mr. Lucina. Um, DVS is very confident that, that the proposal here will create the transparency needed um, in, in titling and branding. And we're very encouraged by, by the, gen, the unanimous support around or the, the large support around this effort. So thank you again. And uh, that concludes my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. Now, members, uh, any discussion to the bill and, uh, or, and or uh, questions of the testifier? Okay, I'm going to scan the uh, uh, one more time here before we uh, vote. Um, well, okay, I don't see any additional discussion, Representative Joachim. So um, if you wanna make any closing statements, um, now is a good time to do that. And or, and or if there's any other of the uh, stakeholders that wanted to say anything, we can... Um, certainly hear your testimony now. I don't see anyone with their hand up. So appreciate them as well. Uh, Representative Joachim, Chairman, Chairperson Joachim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's a good bill. I just appreciate your support. All righty. Well, members, um, I will renew my motion that House File 3296, as amended, be re-referred to the Commerce Committee. Uh, Mr. Dodge, please take the roll. Chair Hornstein. Uh, Hornstein, I. Hornstein, I. Vice Chair Cagle. Aye. Cagle, I. Representative Petersburg. 
Petersburg I. Petersburg I. Representative Barr. Aye. Barr I. Representative Bernardi. Aye. Bernardi I. Representative Elkins. Elkins I. Elkins I. Representative Frederick. Aye. Frederick I. Representative Houseman. Aye. Houseman I. Representative Heinrich. Heinrich I. Heinrich I. Representative Kosnick. Aye. Kosnick I. Representative Mason. Mason I. Mason I. Representative Murphy. Representative Murphy. Murphy I. Murphy I. Representative Nelson. Nelson I. Nelson I. Representative Olson. Olson, I. Olson, I. Representative Richardson is excused. Representative Torkelson. Torkelson, I. Torkelson, I. Representative West. West, I. West, I. There are 16 ayes and zero nays. All right. Well, good work, Representative uh, Joachim. We are, uh, you are headed to Commerce, and we look forward to uh, seeing this bill on the floor soon. And uh, Again, with much, much appreciation for the time and effort you put in. It, it takes a special member to bring everyone together, and it's very much appreciated. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair, and I do miss transportation, so thank you. <laughs> we miss you. So uh, thanks again for your work. Uh, members, we have one more bill uh, on the agenda, and then we'll hear, have an informational uh, session on Corridors of Commerce. Um, our next bill uh, comes to us from... Uh, Representative Kegel and Representative Kegel, um, we are going to uh, lay this bill over. We're not taking action. Um, I will make a couple of uh, comments, and then you you can uh, proceed with your uh, bill um, testimony. And I know you have an amendment as well. Uh, but members, this is um, uh, again a work in progress. Uh, we have had increasing numbers of requests for special plates. Um, I know that um, one of my uh, predecessors uh, who chaired this committee wouldn't even hear these kinds of bills. Um, I think since then, um, you know, we've had several chairs that have heard these bills, myself included, um, but they, we are just seeing increasing numbers of requests. Uh, and, um, while I understand uh, what, why this is and why people want special plates, um, it is really uh, taking quite a bit of um, uh, committee time. And um, I think there have been members in the past that have uh, pointed this out and um, we're searching not, this is no opposition to special plates. It's simply an effort to see if we can streamline the process or requesting special plates. Um, Representative Cagle has an idea she will share with us. Um, I've had a conversation with Representative Petersburg. He's got some thoughts on this question. So keep in mind, this is just an initial conversation we're having as a committee to reform this process, to make it more efficient, both for people who are requesting special plates, uh, for the agencies that have to issue them, uh, and for all of us. So um, I appreciate Representative Cagle, uh, Vice Chair Cagle, that you have taken this on. And um, uh, please tell us about House File 3168. Again, the motion is simply to lay this bill over. I imagine we'll be revisiting it. Uh, many issues and questions will arise today. So again, members, we're not here to, to you know, critique this bill per se, maybe offer some constructive thoughts and advice. And I know that Vice Chair Kagel will take those to heart and we can come back with uh, a more finished product uh, as we move forward in this session. So with that introduction, Representative Kagel, uh, please proceed with a description of your bill and the amendment that you would like us to consider. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so this is a bill that would um, allow DVS, DPS to um, do this specialty plate instead of having to come to the legislature for us to approve it. And so um, what this does is it um, establishes the uh, authority for DPS to um, basically approve and um, discontinue some of these plates. It also eases the um, some of the accessibility issues, I believe, that um, 
that we've seen, you know, it's an expensive process to get um, these plates, uh, the applications in. And so um, the main goal of this is to really, um, yeah, streamline the process, make it more accessible to people. And I think, you know, kind of the historical aspect of this is, um, you know, the, the technology that we use to print our plates is changing, um, has changed. And so um, the cost of these, um, specialty plates has been decreasing. And so what this would do is um, it would, the, so do you want me just to walk through the bill or can we adopt the amendment first? Yeah, let's, um, thank you, Vice Chair Cagle. Let's um, adopt your amendment first and then we can consider your bill as amended. Uh, so if you wanted to explain, uh, it looks like you have an A1 amendment. Yeah, so the A1 amendment um, puts in some of the numbers that we were missing in the dot, dot, dot. So on line um, 2.20, um, we would have at least 1,000 eligible motor vehicles who are um, very likely um, to, and I don't, maybe it'd be easier if Mr. Burris ran through the amendment. Sure. Um, Mr. Burris, do you want to walk us through the A1 amendment? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, so there are, uh... As was mentioned, there, there are a series of changes. Um, well, the, the, the first set of changes is, is spread a little bit throughout the amendment, but it involves um, a modification to how plate design would, would work. Um, you see this beginning on 1.3 of the amendment, and that would uh, shift um, plate design so that instead of it occurring after approval of a, of a proposed special plate, uh, a proposed design or design concept and a proposed inscription would be submitted as part of the plate application. So there's a, a little bit here in the amendment and then a little bit um, later in the amendment that eliminates uh, current law around um, uh, uh, submission of, of design concepts. Uh, the second change, as was uh, just mentioned, is, is filling in the threshold as part of the uh, application process to propose a special plate for a number of uh, eligible vehicle owners who would be uh, intending or very likely to obtain the plate to put a thousand as that threshold. Uh, the next change on 1.7 is to set the application fee at $5,000. Um, and then starting on 1.8 of the amendment, there is uh, another kind of set of changes that center around providing um, more information and guidance to the department on its establishment of standards for whether uh, a plate would be uh, accepted or uh, approved. Um, so what's in the in an original um, bill are uh, a set of criteria, kind of general criteria for uh, approval of plates. The amendment adds um, some additional considerations that the department would look at in determining whether a proposed plate is controversial in nature. So it, it, it sets some considerations. And one of those is based on a public comment process that's also being established in the amendment. So when a, a plate application occurs, the uh, department would go through a process of providing public notice and have a period for comments, would then collect those comments and use that as part of its considerations to judge or determine uh, whether there's um, uh, some some violation of the standards for approval of the plate. Um, the next change is on 1.15 of the amendment, and this raises the the maximum uh, contribution amount if the plate proposer uh, uh, w seeks to include a, a, a donation element. Uh, the amount would be up to sixty dollars annually, and that matches the the highest of the special plates that are in current law. Um, and then the bottom of page one is is that public notice and comment process that I had mentioned. And then there is a, um, a another series of changes at the top of page two that go go back to the plate design process and consultation uh, between the uh, plate proposer and the department on the plate design and the inscription. Um, after that, there is another insertion at 2.13 of the, um, oh, sorry, I just need to double check what that one is. 
Oh, that's the, uh, the threshold for discontinuance of special plates. So in current law, there's a, a, a thousand plate minimum for some special plates that have been uh, established in statute. That's not a provision that actually applies to, to all plates. That's kind of a subset of, generally speaking, the more um, recently created plates, ones that have been established in law in about since about 2010, plus a couple others. Uh, this revises that threshold for when a plate would be discontinued. So it's dropped from 1,000 down to, to 500. Um, and then finally, there is uh, some clarifying language and a, another section being added. This is starting at 2.15 of the amendment. Um, this is to, to clarify the process for plate applicants that have already submitted an application to the department. Um, or had or will have already submitted an application prior to enactment of this change. Um, so it establishes that, that that application serves as the application and that the, the revised requirements wouldn't um, cause a requester to, to need to reapply uh, under the, when this goes into effect, if it were to be enacted, um, this has a, a delayed effective date of January, 2023. Um, so that Mr. Chair, I think covers the, the core of the A1 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Burris. Um, and so members, we're just gonna be voting to adopt this amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like us to consider it. So um, I'll move the uh, A1 amendment members. Is there discussion? Um, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, the motion prevails. And now we have a House file 3168 as amended before us. Uh, Vice Chair Cagle. So this would allow DPS to, uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members, this would just allow DPS to um, be the ones that are really spearheading this process. Uh, well, it's driven by, you know, the people of Minnesota, but they would be the ones to um, approve it so it would no longer have to come in front of the legislature. Thank you. Um, and I have a question from Representative Houseman. Representative Houseman, you probably, Chair Houseman, you probably know the uh, particular chair of the Transportation Committee that I was referring to. Representative Houseman, uh, proceed with your question or comment. Yeah, um, mine is a comment. Um, a reminder of past history and a reminder of uh, Representative Bernie Leader. Uh, I feel sort of obligated to, to be part of his voice today. Um, anytime you go down the road of I would categorize this in the same area as earmarks. When you start doing something for one, how can you ever say no to anyone? And here's what I recall in the early years when we first started down this road. Um, and uh, yes, Representative Leader strongly opposed these. And, and uh, I remember that law enforcement would come and testify against it. Because of the importance of quickly and clearly seeing numbers on a license plate. And, uh, and they warned us about something like this. And I don't know if this one was a joke, but I saw recently whatever we approved last year. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm uh, putting the wrong group at, at uh, fault here, but I, was it 4-H? There was so much stuff on that plate that they were designing, it obscured the numbers. And that's what I recall, that law enforcement worried that if we start mucking up the plate, that it's going to, to cause a problem with quickly and clearly being able to read those numbers. Um, I just feel like for, for the sake of Representative Leader and past history that I just, that this used to be controversial. It's so hard for us to say no. And um, I don't know, um, I mean, yes, we're shifting the responsibility to another entity, but um, whether anyone will, will be able to put some boundaries on, on what we're doing is, is the thing that, occur, that, that concerns me. I don't even know if law enforcement is in the room right now. Um, Representative Houseman, we don't have, uh, thank you for your comments, by the way. We don't have uh, public testimony lined up. Uh, and again, this is, we're, we're having a preliminary discussion. And I, I know that um, Vice Chair Cagle is interested in hearing people's thoughts and, and you know, she'll go back and take those to heart and, and we'll see if we proceed with this uh, later on. And we're hearing this now, members, because I, I Vice Chair Cagle will acknowledge, I will acknowledge it needs some work. Uh, we have creative people on this committee. We have creative ideas. And 
Uh, reminder also that to get your bills in because you know our uh, our deadlines are rapidly approaching. So that's why we're hearing this preliminarily today. Representative Torkelson, then Representative Petersburg, then Representative Mason. Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just thought I should throw in my two cents worth. Uh, I certainly uh, share some of Representative Hausman's concerns. The concern I would like to highlight is uh, we've had a recent proposal that I believe kind of crosses a line into the commercial side of, uh, of the world. Um, I, I don't think we want to start using our license plate system as advertising for those who may benefit commercially from seeing their logo displayed on cars across the state of Minnesota. I'm not going to name names, Mr. Chair, but uh, that's uh, that's my two cents worth. Thank you, Representative Torkelson. Appreciate your comments. Um, well, I've represented Petersburg, then Representative Mason. Well, uh, Chair Torkelson uh, gave you his two cents worth, and and if it's a penny for my thoughts, I'm not sure who gets the extra penny, <laughs> but uh, we'll keep moving forward with that. I I agree that. Um, that this has become kind of overwhelming and we spend a lot of committee time doing this. Uh, however, I also look at what is in reality, what are we doing with these license plates? But I think in on essence, the sides, I'm not how is endorsing whatever is on that license plate. I mean, it, it is a, a state licensed and, and provided by the state to put on each vehicle. And so there is some, I think, responsibility that the state has to make sure and whatever is on these plates has some, some value. And so at first I thought this was a great idea to have somebody else take it away so we don't need to do it. As I reviewed and, and realized, you know, we should keep some responsibility for overseeing that. Uh, and I, other idea that I had to kind of streamline this whole process was what if we were to have a standing, um, call it a subcommittee of uh, a representative uh, DFL and GOP and a Senate GOP and DFL member, four member committee that would meet uh, the first year of the biennium, say at the end of February, uh, in which all the bills for this would be filtered through them. And then they would review, they'd have an opportunity for everybody who wanted to testify for each of, of the bills and, and the license plates. And you would um, uh, then have that committee uh, submit their report to the full committee, a transportation committee, which would then have full oversight or review on, on ones that they may choose to accept or not accept through committee hearing. It would allow us to streamline the process while still keeping the authority to make sure that we keep license plates uh, with messages and so forth uh, under our control as well. That was just an idea I thought of over the last couple of days when I was thinking about this. Um, it's another alternative, something else that we could do. But I just think uh, handing over to a state agency uh, to make that decision kind of creates a little bit of a, a usurping our responsibility. And I think something that we still need to maintain and, um, and be kind of the watch guard for that. So, Mr. Chair, that's, that's my penny for my thoughts. Well, thanks. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And I, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Representative I could just Cagle. Respond. Yeah. I, um, Thank you, Representative Petersburg. That's actually something that um, that uh, DVS actually echoed as well. And so um, we kind of looked at that through the public um, comment period. That's why we added that piece. Um, and then there is a report that was generated to the legislature every year. And I believe the amendment also had a place where we could, where it got kicked. My desk is not big enough for all this paper. <laughs> Um, but there was there was some concern from DPS on that very issue, and so um, they kind of suggested something along the lines of, you know, if there's any kind of controversy, it would get kicked up to the legislature. But um, I I kind of like the idea too of of um, legislators maybe serving on that little board or task force or whatever it is, and you know, once a year you come with a report that says here's the ones we recommend. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you. And, and you know, uh, that sounds good, but I could tell you from uh, experience dealing with the task force, dealing with uh, distribution of highway funds, sometimes the agency's view of what is controversial and what the legislature's view of controversial may be different. And once you give it to an agency, it's their determination of what becomes controversial. 
and then the, again, the legislature only deals with it after the fact. And so I, I think keeping the streamlined process into um, the legislature is better than having just a report coming after the fact. Uh, but that's, again, that's, that's the debate. That's part of what I would see as a little bit of a caution that we should at least uh, make sure we are understanding what those ramifications are. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Oh, and thank you. It's a creative idea. I know you, you shared it with me the other day, and uh, I appreciated that. Uh, maybe that uh, has, you know that type of arrangement can also sift out some of these uh, requests, such as the one that Representative Torkelson referred to. Uh, and then this committee would kind of propose almost like a slate, if you will, uh, to, to the broader committee. So I think there's some some definite um, advantages to that, and. Uh, you know, that this, this is exactly the kind of uh, ideas that we'd like to start talking about. Um, Representative Mason and Representative Kosnick, and then I think we'll be close to wrapping up this bill. Uh, Representative Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I too have some concern about all the decorative plates. I mean, the point is why do we have the plates in the first place and what, are they, are they achieving that particular purpose? And I know I have been looking at plates, a lot of pretty plates we have now, but usually you have to be on top of the car to read through all this stuff to figure out what state it's from. And most of the uh, decorative plates seem to be from Minnesota versus, and I guess one question I have is how many other states have allow all this decoration on the plates. But again, my concern is why are we having, yeah, what is the purpose of the plates? And are we making it really difficult for that purpose to be, uh, is, it, is that working when we put all the extra stuff on it? And uh, I would like to add one thing. I don't know if it would be appropriate, but I had, Two times now where I've had my, you have a car for seven years and you have to get new plates. My plates are still in really good condition. So can you add like making it eight or nine years or something? Because there's really no purpose in just changing uh, plates just for the heck of it. I'm, I mean, at least in my opinion. So hopefully that's clear. It's just, are we doing the right thing for having the plates? Otherwise, if it's mainly for decoration now, it's, it, I don't know if we can really justify the, the money being spent. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, perspective, um, Representative Mason. Um, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Vice Chair Cagle. I, I appreciate the efforts of this bill and read it when, I, when it was first introduced. I think your amendments uh, add, um, some good provisions in there in terms of figuring out when to uh, decommission plates. I am of the camp that we have way too many uh, specialty plates. I'm not a big fan of all the particular extra plates, um, but you know they're all generally very good um, organizations or such that that are asking for them. Uh, I, I appreciate Representative Hausman's comments. Uh, in reference to the law enforcement, uh, trying to have it standardized a little bit more. And so uh, I think we're, we're on to something, uh, a good topic that, that we need to figure out. Uh, my caution and concern is uh, giving legislative authority to the administrative branch. Uh, I personally have uh, big issues with, with ceding more and more control uh, to an agency or just the uh, executive branch. And so I think the intent is, is uh, I would agree with, but uh, that's the big problem I have. I, I would like to see maybe the committee uh, establish uh, more stringent boundaries of when we do any of those plates, if, if we should do any more at all. And at what point do we uh, stop doing uh, plates that aren't really being used and functioned? And uh, there was another bill uh, currently in the legislature that um, will be used to fund a, a, an agency of uh, a new, newly created board. Uh, and I have, uh, I don't 
know how that will work out for him, but I, I also don't, uh, uh, I'm not real comfortable with uh, that funding mechanism for a newly created board as well. So uh, I appreciate bringing this bill forward and, and working on it. If be happy to work with you offline um, as you work through it, but I appreciate uh, having this hearing and, and taking some uh, considerations. I, uh, I think we all recognize the issue and uh, I prefer not to sit here uh, in committee and, and hear so, so many of these issues. Um, it, it puts us in a bad position to say, oh, we don't support this group or that group, uh, but really what it is is uh, what's the proper purpose of a license rather than um, approving of a group or not. And you know, Many of them are very popular groups, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's, uh, they should have a special license plate. And, and it gets hard to say, Noted that 4 Hers, for instance, or any other group that's um, in all other respects, uh, there is no controversy. So thank you for uh, bringing this discussion forward and I stand uh, available to you as you work, work on that to work some of, through some of these issues. Thank you. Thanks, Representative Koznick. I appreciate your very constructive and thoughtful comments. And um, I do not see any additional hands up uh, and so it sounds like, Representative Cagle, you're on to something and you've got some uh, members that are willing to help you. And I, I think that's a good sign. Uh, uh, and I just wanted to see if you had any final comments. Again, members, we're not voting. We're just simply going to lay this bill over and uh, see what um, other ideas can percolate here. But I know we have a lot of interest and in, in support for your efforts. And, you know, I think it's just not... I think it's just a question of figuring out what we can we can come up with that um, both streamlines the process, but what I'm hearing is maintain some legislative uh, oversight or control. So with that, Representative Cagle, do you have any final thoughts or comments? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I think um, some of the ideas I wrote down was kind of a, a plate slate. Um, we oh wow! You know, you've already got the, uh, the the you've already got the sound bite. I like that. Yeah. So uh, you know, maybe we can have some sort of um, you know DPS overview process, and then the 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 plate slate would come to us. Um, another idea that I kind of um, heard was maybe capping the amount of specialty plates. So as some get decommissioned, that allows more spots for other ones to come into. Um, that was just kind of a, a note I wrote down. Um, also, with the design of plates, maybe we can have some sort of like standardized form. So there's only one thing on the plate that changes, and that's the logo or whatever it is. Um, and so I think, you know, just through this process, getting some good ideas of, of how we can refine this bill and change it so that, uh, you know, we still, you know, the thing I'm hearing is that we should still have legislative control, um, but we definitely um, don't want to have you know, every every specialty plate coming before the legislature. And so I am um, very willing to work with any legislator who um, is interested. And I would um, definitely like to also bring in um, law enforcement. And I know I did work with um, DVS as well when drafting some of these amendments and getting feedback. So I am definitely willing to make this a collaborative process and hope um, eventually we can get something that we can agree on. So thank you all. Thanks so much, Vice Chair Cagle, um, and uh, and and to the members that spoke, uh, very helpful comments, and I'm confident we can move forward and um, make some needed reforms uh, to this process. Uh, okay, members. So again, um, we are laying over um, House File 3168 as amended, and uh, we'll potentially revisit this when we put together our committee bill. So members, we have one final item on the agenda and it's an important one. Um, uh, we have had a, a, at least one member and I, I think several others uh, over the years have uh, asked uh, to get an overview of the Corridors for Commerce, uh, Corridors of Commerce program. Um, you know, we've ha we have a number of new members and uh, this has been referred to, I think um, maybe mentioned quickly in, in a MnDOT overview last year, but we haven't really taken a deep dive as a committee recently on this program. And, uh, you know, I was involved in its inception in 2013, and I think the goal was to, uh, we, we had so many different um, 
uh, highways that had uh, for many, many years had been um, at, advocated for. They were good projects. They enhanced commerce in many instances, uh, but we didn't really have a mechanism to um, uh, to get them funded and um, and separated out as particular as particularly high priority projects, you know, within the MnDOT sol uh, project selection. So this uh, program was created. Uh, it's been very successful. Um, you know, we've finished Highway 23. We finished. Uh, we've made a lot of progress on Highway 14. Uh, there's a, a number of others that are, you know, if you've been on this committee for a while, you you can kind of recite these highways and their numbers in your sleep. Um, but uh, over the years, um, you know, there have been some issues have uh, arisen. Um, uh, and uh, I think it's time now, um, almost 10 years into the program, that the legislature take another look at the, the program and see what needs to be changed, what, what needs to be reformed, uh, whether it's regional balance, whether it's the criteria for selection. And I appreciate the fact that Representative Torkelson has taken this on. Um, he has you know, all, also been very involved in the program since its inception, uh, has offered many constructive comments uh, over the years. And so uh, there will be potentially a bill coming uh, uh, with some changes to the program uh, that will come before us before deadline. Um, but in preparation for consideration of, of that legislation, I thought it'd be really important for us to get an overview of the program, uh, both uh, get some of Representative Torkelson's thoughts, and then uh, we'll hear from MnDOT uh, about just giving us sort of corridors of commerce 101, so that when we really dig into the potential legislation on this, uh, we'll have some background and everybody will be on the same page in terms of their knowledge of the program. So that's what we want to do here in the next uh, 38 minutes or so. Um, uh, and I will uh, at this point call on Representative Torkelson uh, to introduce the topic to us as a committee, uh, maybe give us some of his preliminary thoughts, and then we'll have an overview presentation from Minda. So Representative Torkelson, thank you for your work on this. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your, your kind words and your introduction to uh, what I've been working on for a while. Um, Corridors, I believe, is an extremely valuable program that has uh, taken on a bit of life of its own, so to speak. I don't think it's going away, but it's also had uh, a bit of a bumpy ride uh, for various reasons through the time that it's been in place. Uh, my objective uh, with this work is to improve the program uh, make it useful and important uh, because I believe that if the program is in good shape and we as legislators trust that our investments in corridors are well used, it's more likely that the program will be funded. Uh, and as everyone on this committee, I think, understands uh, accessing funds for transportation is always a challenge. Uh, this uh, particular route uh, for funding projects, as I said, has been successful in the past. And it can be even more successful in the future if it's well constructed and uh, supported by uh, legislators on both sides of the street. Uh, the uh, department has been working on, on some of their ideas, and many of them are good ideas. I know they've been uh, gone around the state to the various ATPs and presented uh, both the history of the program and some of their legislative ideas, and I look forward to their presentation today and I'll have so we'll go through my ideas after they've uh, presented their uh, review and uh, and their own ideas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Rep. Thank you, Representative Torkelson. Um, and with that, um, we have two uh, uh, folks from MnDOT here with us today, Mr. Udine and Mr. Wiedemann. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Udine, did you want to start us off? And then, um, or is it Mr. Wiedemann, whoever? Uh, but uh, welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record. So I will go first, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay. Uh, welcome the to the committee. <laughs> welcome to the committee, Mr. Wiedemann. Please say, yeah. uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, uh, I'm I'm uh, uh, Patrick Wiedemann. I'm with Wiedemann. MnDOT's Sorry Office of Terrain. That. 
Yeah, that, that's fine. I don't I don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, with MnDOT's Office of Transportation System Management, and my section is responsible for oversight and management of this program. And so uh, we're going to, Eric and I are going to go through today, uh, give you a little bit of background uh, about the program, some issues that come up, and then Eric will, com will come in and, and talk about some future ideas we have. So uh, next slide. Uh, a little bit of legislative history. As, uh, as, as Chair Hornstein stated, the program was initiated in 2013. Uh, the legislature provided $300 million in, in bonds to fund it. The priority at that time was to get projects in the ground and construction. We had a big list of, of, of things that were behind. And then in 2014, the legislature provided a $6.5 million only for Greater Minnesota. That was part of a legislative uh, agreement deal. And the priority for that was to get projects ready for uh, uh, potential future funding of Quarters of Commerce uh, that didn't necessarily get funded you know, from the 2013 funding. In 2015, we also received $25 million in funds. 50% of it was marked for Greater Minnesota and 50% for the metro area. And again, the priority of that and goal of that funding was to get projects ready on the shelf for future funding from COC. Next slide. In 2017, the legislature provided another $300 million in bonds along with $25 million annually in trunk highway cash. Uh, but as part of that in 2017, there also were changes to the program and, and how it operates in response to the 2016 legislative auditor's report on MnDOT's project selection process. And that's gonna come into play in a little while later. In 2018, there was another $400 million in bonds provided to the program. The priority for that area was established in the actual uh, special session criteria in the law. So that, that had very distinct criteria for which projects uh, could receive funding. And then in 2021, uh, during the special session, there was $200 million in bonds provided uh, last time and with a requirement that MnDOT begin the solicitation by August 1st of this year. Next slide. Uh, the 2017 legislative changes, again, these were in response to the uh, uh, legislative auditor's report. Number one, it required MnDOT to score and rank all of the projects that were submitted to it as project recommendations using only the eight crit evaluation criteria in law, not adding anything, not subtracting anything, no screens, no nothing. We had to use just those and we had to use all eight. We were prohibited from considering project deliverability as a criteria. That's something we had used in 2013 on the ability to deliver. And then we clarified that, uh, it, that MnDOT must accept project recommendations from the Area Transportation Partnership and other interested stakeholders that whenever we go out and are going to, we receive funding, we need to physically go out and take those recommendations. Those were all contained within the changes of in 2017 when the, that funding was passed. Next. So here's some quick samples of the, of the projects. These are not all of them, by the way. Uh, we do have a report out uh, that, the, that I believe was available in your packet that will show you all the projects, but just as a sampling, in 2013, a couple of projects that were funded were Highway 14 from Nicolet to North Mankato and the Highway 610 freeway completion on the north side. Uh, in 2014, Highway 34 up near Detroit Lakes, there was the installation of a center turn lane for freight uh, movement. Uh, Highway 23 had some environmental work done for the Richmond to New London expansion. In 2015, uh, we had some preliminary design for the intersection of Highway 15 and Highway 14, if you're familiar with that. And I-35W, the preliminary design for the interchange with for, I, Interstate 494. Uh, from 2017, uh, the, we had, uh, the, these are the actual four projects that were selected in, in 2017. The I-94 project, which was to expand to six lanes from Rogers to St. Michael. Uh, Highway 169, convert to a freeway in Elk River. I-35W, expand, uh, uh, expand the interchange with uh, I-494 to make a turbine-style interchange. And on I-494, add the Easy Pass or the Time Min Pass from France Avenue to Highway 77. And then in 2018, as I mentioned, those kind of came, those were projects that were kind of uh, set up as being scored before in 2017. And those projects were New London to Richmond, expand to four lanes. Highway 14, Owatonna to Dodge Center, expand to four lanes, and Highway 252, 
convert to a freeway and easy pass dowling to highway 610. So issues with the current process. Uh, the number one is the number of projects needing evaluation. In 2017, we received 173 unique project recommendations. Because of the change in the 2017 law, MnDOT is required to evaluate, develop, estimate, and score all of those projects. That required a significant amount of time and effort on the part of both you know, MnDOT's own internal staff as well as all of our local agencies and partners as we had to go through each one of these individual projects and kind of get it to a level where we felt comfortable enough that we could score and rank it. The next issue that we've been experiencing has been the interpretation of regional balance. Uh, in 2017, we utilized a historical soft kind of 50-50 approach to regional balance. And what that really means is, is that for the metro district area of Mendot, which is the eight counties, the seven county metro area plus Chisago, uh, we would approximately get 50% of the funds to that area and then 50% for the remainder of the state. Uh, after the announcement in 2017 of the actual winning projects, there was significant pushback as to our interpretation of regional balance. Next slide. Um, so uh, again, these are the projects that were selected in 2017. Uh, I-494 and I-494-35W, there was no issue with that at all. They were very much clearly Metro projects. However, uh, Trunk Highway 169 in Elk River and the I-94 St. Michael to Albertville, they are all in District 3, which is in our greater Minnesota district, but there was a lot of uh, criticism that that is a unique interpretation of regional balance. And so we, because of the amount of pushback we received, we felt that that is uh, something that is very much needing to be clarified. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Eric. Um Thank you so much, Mr. Weideman. Um, that was really, really helpful. Um, Mr. Rudine, uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Eric Rudine with MnDOT Government Affairs, and uh, I will uh, take some of the background that Patrick has laid out and, um, and try to present some of the proposals um, that, that we're bringing forward. Uh, for, for improving the program. So the, the first one um, gets to that issue that Patrick highlighted about um, currently being required to score every project that's submitted. And so uh, what we're proposing is that we have uh, sort of an additional step in that process. And uh, our proposal would, would ask the area transportation partnerships to help us screen down uh, the number of projects that are recommended. So, for example, maybe each ATP in Greater Minnesota would uh, select um, sort of their three top projects, and then those three would go through the full scoring process. And uh, that would help, you know, limit the, the number of projects, obviously, that we would have to take through that, that full process, uh, which, as Patrick highlighted, can be uh, rather extensive. Uh, he also highlighted the, the challenge we've had with regional balance. And so uh, we are proposing that uh, the legislature put uh, a definition in the statute of what regional balance means. And our proposal is to have approximately half the funds be spent in the MnDOT Metro District and then half in, in Greater Minnesota. Uh, but I will say that we are very open to other uh, definitions of regional balance. I, I think we, we would even maybe say we're agnostic about what that definition should be. Uh, we would just like some sort of legislative uh, guidance in that area so that uh, when we do future solicitations, we, we have something uh, that we can rely on. And then we're also proposing to create uh, a small projects category um, and uh, this, again, I think would help us get to the, the regional balance uh, challenge that we've had. Uh, if we created a small projects category for projects under $10 million, we could do some of those, um, some of those small, smaller type projects. Uh, again, we're proposing 25% 
um, that would go into a small projects category, but uh, you know, hopefully this would help us distribute more projects uh, all around the states. And so, uh, you know, we are certainly working with Representative Torkelson. We appreciate his his input uh, on on some of these proposals. Uh, we've also gotten some feedback from the Met Council, um, and uh, you know, we've we've certainly been talking to lots of local officials as well. And uh, although we, as the department, have brought a proposal forward, you know, I, I don't know that we're uh, particularly committed uh, to the specifics. Uh, we would just really like to see some changes uh, before we have to begin that solicitation process for the two hundred million uh, that last year's legislature already authorized, uh, so that we don't have uh, some of these challenges that we've seen, uh, especially recently, uh, with administering the program. So. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, um, that, that's kind of a high level overview of, of some of the challenges we've seen and some of the proposals that we would have for, for trying to address those challenges. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Rudin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Weideman. Um, Representative Torkelson, I know you have some thoughts to share as well. Um, why don't we do that and then we can sort of take member questions and uh, of all three of the uh, folks that have um, made presentations today. So, uh, Representative Torgelson, I'm already seeing some fruits to your labor potentially here with uh, this MnDOT presentation, but if you wanted to uh, maybe share a little bit more about what you're thinking uh, with the committee, that would be great. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to uh, uh, both Mr. Rudin and Mr. Weideman for their work on this topic. Uh, they've spent a lot of time uh, thinking about it and working on it. We've had a, a, quite a few discussions over the last number of months as we kind of try to bring focus on to how we may improve this program. I'd also point out in members' packets, there is a letter from the Transportation Alliance. I've also been in contact with them on a regular basis. Uh, they have some good ideas in their letter that I think certainly are, are worthy of consideration. And we will, as we work toward actual bill language, we will uh, certainly consider their ideas too. Uh, and the door is open, frankly. I, uh, I'm really uh, trying to be uh, very receptive to others' ideas in this process, including the department and uh, eventually perhaps those the other body across the street. And uh, <laughs> and see if we can't come up with something that, that uh, we have confidence that will be a good program moving forward. Uh, it's always subject to revision in the future too, but uh, let's see if we can get a good uh, improve on the foundation. Um, so in your packets, there's also a, a document, my document that is titled Revising Corridors of Commerce. Um, and it's really just a series of bullet points uh, that kind of summarizes some of my ideas. None of this is written in stone at this point. Um, it's still uh, being uh, noodled on and revised. So if members have ideas of their own, please, uh, please contact me and let me know what you're thinking and we'll uh, try to have a good collaborative process. Uh, bullet point one, staying focused on projects on the inter-regional corridor system. And there is a map. I don't have a copy available, but I know the department has a map of the inter-regional excuse me, corridor system. And I, my understanding is that all the projects to date have been part of that system. So it's not like we're looking at every road in the state. We're looking at a network of roads that has really been identified as the corridors of commerce. Um, and I went to the original language, uh, uh, impact on improving capacity and facilitating the movement of freight. That's uh, how the program started. And I believe that's still a good, a good uh, theme for corridors of commerce. Um, I personally am not, I understand the reasoning behind the $10 million small project idea. Um, I just am afraid that whatever number we pick, it's somewhat arbitrary to define small versus large. Uh, I don't see any reason why both small and large projects could not be submitted uh, to the process for evaluation uh, and let the ATPs or other projects uh, proposers decide which projects they think are important regardless of the size of the project. Uh, the other question that I'm really struggling with is the one of legislative input. Um, uh, those of us that have been around here a while know that uh, 
end of session negotiations often involve a discussion of earmarks. Uh, many of us, uh, past chairs and others, have been opposed to earmarks, including myself and the current chair, Representative Hornstein, I believe I'm not putting words in your mouth. But there are others who think that earmarks are, are appropriate, uh, where legislators actually pick projects and say, DOT, you're going to fund this, period. Um, I don't think that's a good idea. I think it, it potentially leads us to a path where uh, we have a point in the session where everybody has their map out and is picking out their favorite project and then those with the most political power in transportation get theirs funded and others are ignored that's that's just not appropriate uh there's there are better ways to do this work but at the same time i believe corridors uh, presents us with an opportunity to build legislative input into the process so that legislators do feel they do have an influence on project selection uh, and that uh, that is important because if legislators have input, uh, significant input, I think it's more likely that the program will be supported and funded as we move forward. I kind of imagine this as being in, in at two different levels within the process. So the first level is when projects are proposed. Some of those projects are fully vetted and some of those are just ideas uh, and legislators should have input and working through the ATP system that the department has identified where legislators could work with their regional ATPs to select a limited number of projects, I think is a good idea. Uh, but then there's also the point at the, in the process where projects are actually selected. Uh, I think there should be a way where we can have limited legislative input at that end of the process too, where we've actually pick, picking the projects that are gonna be funded with corridors funds, not that the legislators would necessarily have veto power, but that they would have some, uh, some form of input into how those final projects are selected. Uh, uh, we've had some issues with uh, projects being selected that were really not uh, fully vetted. Uh, we didn't really know what the price tag was. And when you pick a project that has a a undervalued price tag on it and you get into designing the project and find out it's it's, it's much more expensive than, ex than expected, that puts a real strain on the system as to where those extra funds need to be, might be found. So um, we need to make sure that the projects that make it to the list are projects that we have a pretty good understanding of what their scope and cost is. Um, I'm also suggesting when I say here that submitted projects must be discrete, what I'm saying is uh, we should avoid what happened uh, in that last major allocation where we had some proposals where they'd propose a piece of a project as one project and then they'd include that same piece in a larger project and submit it a second time. Uh, that caused a lot of extra work for the department to try and evaluate projects in in a piecemeal fashion um, and just not a good idea. Uh, there's a date in the current legislation of August 1st, 2022. If we're gonna make significant changes in the, in the program, I think we need to expend, extend, excuse me, the amount of time available for the department to work through this process with the ATPs and put together a final list. And we will uh, I'll work with the department to try and pick a date that is appropriate so they can do their work in a timely fashion. Then we get to the question of regional balance. I'm sure many of you remember the map that uh, came out when we had what I describe as the blueberry in a very large bowl of tomato soup, uh, where the projects were in and centered around the metropolitan part of the state. And it upset me uh, personally, and I think it upset, I know it upset a lot of other people. Um, so I'm proposing that we go about this a little differently. Um, instead of just using the metro service area, which is kind of an arbitrary set of counties that really doesn't include the entire metro, I'm suggesting we divide the projects into three pots. Uh, pot number one metro projects would be projects that are either connected to or within the interstate belt line around the metropolitan area. Uh, pot number two would be uh, metro connector projects. In other words, projects that are out state, but really uh, they allow access into and or out of the metropolitan 
area. Uh, and we have, I think we kind of all know what those major roads are that lead directly in and out of, out of the metro. And then finally, a third pot would be uh, regional center projects. So projects that either connect regional centers or connect regional centers to other parts of the, of the country, uh, out of state. Uh, would get us uh, those projects in greater Minnesota. I haven't assigned percentages yet to uh, those three pots, and that's uh, uh, a topic of discussion as to how we divide the pot percentage-wise. Uh, and that, Mr. Chair, is kind of a brief outline of uh, where, what I'm thinking of proposing and putting into language to be brought to this committee sometime in the near future. Well, thank you, Representative Torkelson, and I really appreciate your not only your work on this, but uh, your your preparatory uh, memo. It's clear uh, your priorities and the direction you'd like to go, and of course, Mindat as well. Very good and clear presentation. So, uh, members, we have a couple of questions uh, already, and um, we we do have ample time if others want to chime in. Um, we're going to start with Representative Mason and then move to Representative West. Representative Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a com couple of comments. One is definitely when uh, the Quarters of Commerce, Commerce was initiated, it was to accomplish a certain objective and uh, and it may have imp impacted the overall list of other projects as well. But I guess my greater concern seems to be now that we're seeing more, uh, I don't know, grandstanding or earmarking taking place. And that bothers me a whole lot. I mean, we've, we know that there have been projects and these are projects where people are dying on some of these roads. And yet, they could be there for, they, they're losing their spots where we're, for whatever reason, other, other projects are being put in front of them. And I guess I would like us to be, figure out how we can truly honor that, the list that we have and stop playing games with things at the top. And I know it's, a lot of this has to do with political issues or whatever, but I guess I find it really concerning because our roads, I mean, it's a public safety thing and people should be able to count on us doing the best job we can without getting involved in a whole lot of political uh, decisions. Just just some thoughts. I have, I've been talking with a couple of people recently about this same thing. So this topic really is, it hits home right now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Representative Mason, and you know I, I appreciated that Representative Torkelson um, and I uh, and and many others, uh, past transportation chairs in particular, have a similar view that you do, uh, Representative Mason, about earmarking. And um, I think a letter was written, maybe in as far back as 2017, 2016. I don't remember. Um, where again, we had many, many past chairs uh, sign that letter, and I think we laid out the rationale for why your marking is problematic. So I appreciate your raising that. Um, Representative West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I love to see investments go into the Corridors of Com Commerce program. It's incredibly important, but nobody's ever happy with the results. And that's usually how it goes. And I guess I'll offer an alternative viewpoint to uh, Representative Torkelson and Representative Mason in the chair is there's a reason we haven't seen the kind of investment in transportation that we've needed to see in this state. And it's because of the way we allocate the funds. If you wanna get something done, you gotta get people engaged and give them incentive to be engaged. And trying to take politics out of the political process is like trying to make an omelet without cracking eggs. It, can't, it essentially can't be done unless you're gonna buy that prefab garbage that comes in a carton. So one thing that I wanna make clear is that we can work together and earmarks are a way 
we can work together and actually get the investment in our roads and bridges that we need. And lastly, a lot of comments have been made about how a earmarked project or something like that is not well thought out and they, they're not, they could not be ready or the cost estimates are gone. And I would say that applies to agency projects as well as earmarks. And that's up for the legislature to decide. We shouldn't be approving earmarks that the legislator proposing them hasn't done the footwork to make sure they're squared up and ready to go. Because we've, been, we've seen that the agencies also make tremendous mistakes when it comes to cost overruns and not anticipating problems. So with all this talk that earmarks are of the devil, I think we need to understand it's part of politics and it's how we can get things done and actually get the money we need to rebuild this crumbling infrastructure in our state. Particularly in my case, Highway 65, there wasn't nearly enough movement until we started jumping up and down about that particular issue and was able to get it earmarked. So the process is moving. So I think we need to value that sense of it more to where this is how you get people to work together. And we don't work together very well down here. Now, I think we work together pretty well. Uh, Representative West, you cut out for a sec. Can you hear us? Um, we work together well on this committee, but I just want to offer an internal alternative viewpoint to where we can actually get this done. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Representative West, for your comments. And, um, you know, they are well taken. I, um, I had to grapple with the exact issues that um, you're raising in our um, conference committee last year because this was really important issue for the Senate. And, you know, so there were lots, I mean, I don't remember, maybe Mr. Dean remembers uh, better than I do. I, I think there were, there was a couple dozen at least uh, of these earmark type projects. And, um, you know, in, in order to get to agreement, uh, we, we took some in our bill, uh, but, you know, we, we at least had some criteria. I mean, some of these projects weren't even shovel ready. They were still in a very early stage of planning. They didn't have the citizen buy-in, uh, Representative West, that you very um, appropriately talked about. So I felt less bad uh, about these projects because uh, at least MnDOT said, well, the, these are ready. This group of projects are ready. This other group are not. And so when we did have specific projects in our bill last year uh, that I think um, passed you know, very overwhelmingly, I was pleased with that on a bipartisan basis. Um, those were projects that at least I think met some minimal criteria. And um, so if we're going down that direction, we better make sure that, um, that there are criteria and that they are shovel ready and we're not picking winners and losers based on, on politics. Um, but you're, you make a good point, Re uh, Representative West. I always thought it was funny when we have a discussion on the House floor and one member will accuse another of being political. <laughs> we're politicians. It's like, you don't say to the doctor, you know, hey doc, can you make the uh, procedure a little less medical, right? So, um, you know, so I, I, I think you have some, um, some good points there that are that are worth noting. So, uh, members, I don't see um, any uh, any uh, more uh, comments. Um, I don't know if uh, any of the testifiers, either from um, MnDOT or Representative Torkelson, wants to leave us with uh, any words of wisdom. But um, I'll leave you with a big thank you and look forward to. Uh, I think this is a good year to to have this discussion. I think it's a good year to address the uh, the corridors issues. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to this. You know what, let's have one more comment from Representative Kosnick and then we'll have the summary comments. I, I don't know if your hand is up from last time or you just are raising it now, Representative Kosnick. Uh, I just, just raised it. Excellent. Kind of working off my, I am in we, my office, but I'm working off my phone, so. Okay, well, we, we have time. We have time for your comment or question, Representative Kosnick. So uh, the floor is yours. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. and. Uh, Representative 
Torkelson, I, I think you gave a great overview, and I look forward to seeing your uh, ideas in legislative language bill form. Um, but I think it's, you know, it, the corridors of commerce, and this kind of speaks to the more geopolitical struggle that we have sometimes, or I take that back, we have it quite frequently in transportation. And I know it's a, a very big concern of yours, Chair Torkelson, of where the money's spent, and you're trying to represent your district, and everybody else is trying to represent uh, theirs. And I, I think it may, you know, I, I look forward to your bill, but I think it's important to recognize uh, the the purposes of the corridors of commerce relation in relation to where the other dollars are spent in our state in terms of geopolitical, if that's really what the crux of this is, uh, whether it's in state or out state. And um, I am curious to work on this. You know, the whole metro gets lumped into one big tub of uh, of projects where we're competing against each other, but yet we fail to recognize quite frequently the amount of traffic and commerce that is uh, happening in, in that area. And it's not to diminish projects that are important in other regional centers. Um, but I think we fail to recognize that quite frequently. I think there was a memo put out and I was digging for it in my office here, but I'm unable to find it uh, that talked about how many of these uh, projects and I think it was in the bonding were in the Metro and it wasn't fair because they were, you know, wasn't uh, outstate and all this kind of stuff. And I, I think we do a disingenuous effort to our mission of providing safe roads and transport transportation uh, throughout the state when, when we just look at that factor of where the projects are located. So I hope that your bill uh, encompasses uh, the need for transportation uh, the need for commerce and and actually transporting and and helping improve our economy uh, with factors such as the number of usage in these areas. Um, and I, I fully recognize that you know a road in say Mankato or Rochester is not going to be the same as uh, Bloomington and Edina or Eden. Um, but it is also but it is important to note of uh, where that those projects tend to cost more. Ex may be more expensive, but they're more highly used uh, in a highly populated area. So uh, I just kind of want to re-caution, not just uh, Representative Torkelson, uh, but the, when we're looking at this and then we're all trying to provide for our districts, I get it, uh, but we're also trying to provide a safe and efficient network of, of highways and bridges uh, throughout the state that are important. And we need to do that as effectively as possible with the limited resources that we have and rather than just throwing out a sheet of paper that says, hey, look, we got five projects outstate and this is how much money they spent in the Metro. I don't know that that's always helpful and it's a, a frustration of mine as well. So I look forward to seeing uh, more discussion on this and the, the bill, but I, I thought it was important to put on the record um, that this is a, a well-known struggle, the geopolitical tensions that have, have here. And rather than escalate them, let's be honest about what we're doing with our transportation dollars and, and where we spend our transportation dollars. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you, Representative Kosnick. Representative Torkelson, last word here. Ring us home. Very briefly, though. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I never, I don't think anyone has envisioned that quarters of commerce is the only way that projects get funded around the state. It's it's another uh, another funding mechanism that has attracted additional dollars to transportation, and I hope it continues that way. Uh, I appreciate uh, both uh, all the comments today. Um, it's it's challenging work, frankly. Uh, it's it's no easy thing, and it will always be controversial. Uh, but this particular program has been very useful in getting some projects moving that otherwise uh, were languishing. They weren't they weren't happening. And I congratulate uh, Representative Hornstein on his original concept of this uh, with others uh, getting it in place because it has been helpful. Uh, and I hope that we could come up with something that uh, that uh, is useful. Uh, it, project selection will always be controversial. I don't think there's any way to avoid that. I think we all need to remember that when a project gets funded, it's it's that a project is taken off the list, and that means our projects, and we all have our favorite projects. Our projects move up the list another notch. 
uh, for the next round. You will notice, at least in my remarks, I do not, I try not to criticize any individual project. They're all worthy. Uh, but how we select the ones that get funded is is a, is part of our job here at the legislature, and uh, putting together a program that works is something I think is is a valuable exercise. Uh, I will liken it a little bit to redistricting. You know, when people ask me about redistricting, they said, "Well, what's the first thing you look at?" I said, "I look at my own district first, of course." Doesn't everybody? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good note to end on. Thank you, members. Um, we are. Uh, we'll be adjourned now. I just wanted to let you know our, our next meeting on Tuesday, we'll be talking about uh, bus rapid transit, electric buses, and I look forward to that. And uh, members, we are adjourned and have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.